Welcome, this is part two in a four-part series on how to play jazz guitar, walking bass lines, and chords at the same time. In this lesson, we're gonna learn about how to play walking bass lines when you need to play over just a single chord vamp. So what if you wanna play uh, walking bass lines and chords together over a chord progression, but the chord progression is not really a progression at all. It's just one chord, whether that's for two bars or four bars or eight bars or however long. How do you keep walking bass line going and interjecting chords at the same time? There's a link in the description to a playlist of all the lessons in this series on doing jazz guitar, walking bass lines and chords at the same time. You don't have to have seen any of the previous videos to um, get what you need to out of this one or the next one or the next one. They're not sequential in that way. They do build on each other, but they all stand alone as well. The first lesson in the series was about how to play walking bass lines and chords together when you just have two beats per chord in a progression so check that out if you want to like I said you don't have to know that to benefit from this but the whole mini series is designed to give you a complete package of what you need to then uh, play over an actual tune and whatever might happen in real music today we're gonna go over the simplest way to start playing walking bass lines around a single chord and how to start adding the harmony at the same time into that and then we're going to expand on the bass line and talk about what chord shapes we might need if we want to land on a chord tone of the chord that's not the root. When you play the root, it makes sense what chord to add in because it's a root position chord. What if you're landing on the third of the chord? What chord shape can you use? Because we are trying to play the bass line and the chords at the same time. So we're going to talk about that. It's very simple and straightforward, very cool, but it takes a little getting used to. And then we'll finish it off by talking about adding extensions to chords and what to do about some situations like a diminished chord or a dominant seven flat nine because that changes things a little bit. So we'll do that at the end. <laughs> I'm Jared Borkowski from SoundGuitarLessons.com. On this channel, I teach on a wide variety of topics, including music theory, mapping out the fretboard, and definitely a lot of jazz guitar, jazz harmony, jazz theory. And I like to explore all kinds of genres, including jazz, uh, so we can just have fitness over music, have control over music, and be able to express ourselves the way that we want to. If you're new here, welcome, and please subscribe and hit the bell. The first thing I want to show you is just how the two obvious notes that you can add around the chord, it's going to seem it's going to seem obvious, but it's going to be the note below and the note above. So here's how I want you to practice that. Okay, so let's say you're on a G major 7 chord, um, and if you want to say you're just playing on that, yeah, or, or whatever you, you know, even if you have other voicings to play, well, where's that walking bass line gonna come from? Well, the first thing to add is just the note below and the note above. With any chord type, we'll do a couple other chord types too. Um, but as simple as it is, that's what it is. So to get the feel down and start practicing with that, a one, seven, one, two, one, two, one, seven, one, two. So notice the one, the root of the chord is on every beat one and every beat three. So that's great. That's what we want because beat one and beat three are where we're gonna add the chords in. So um, if we just take that, we start adding a chord and I want you to add the chord, whatever shape I'm using this G major seven shell voicing or a complete voicing is fine. Uh, one, seven, three, five, or one, seven, and three. Um, the, what I want you to do is put that every time you hit the root, you play that chord. Okay, and then we'll create a variety of ways to hit the chord. We're gonna play it now right on the upbeat after the root comes every time. Instead of on the same spot, we're gonna do the upbeat. So that's my favorite one, but it sounds best when you have the variety. And the other one is a com combination of both. I talked about this in the last video too. I call these chord punches. Slow it down a little bit. So I do them kind of exclusively and then try to do a combo. So it already sounds relatively dynamic by just having those different chord punches. Obviously this is you know, just going over and over again. We're gonna mix that up in just a sec too. Before we do that, let's just address other chord types. So say you're on G dominant seven, and I'll address it off the fifth string as well. So G dominant seven, you can still play that half step below. But on a chord with a flat seven, you can choose to do that half step uh, below or a whole step below it up and 
then it's kind of nice because you can also chromatically walk between those. Gives us even more variety already. What if it's a minor seven chord? Same thing. So a lot of stuff to already work on just with that information. I want you to try it also off the fifth string, which is going to make sure we can do it off the sixth string and the fifth string. So the fifth string, let's go ahead and do D major seven. Okay. Mix up those chord punches. Sometimes I'm doing just a variety between the three different ways of playing the chord. So D major seven, let's go ahead and do D dominant seven. So that's a good amount of practice to just kind of get that feel down. Let's do D minor seven. And don't worry, we're, we're going to add more. This is just the first step, right? But it already is a good amount going on. So the next thing we want to do is just expand the bass line. So we know that we can do that below. We can go above and back. But we want to be able to go to the next chord tone up as well. So one, two, three. So on that G major seven uh, chord, we're going to have one, seven, one, two, three. Now on one of the strong beats, one or three, um, you can land on the three. You could argue that you want to only land on that on beat three, but I don't mind it on beat one as well, and not something to really worry about too much. In this exercise, when you're playing a real tune, your ear will help guide you, and I do tend to um, land on the root on beat one if I'm playing a real tune, real progression, and then use that um, three. We're going to add a chord above it as well. Um, use that three on, on beat three. But for now, just walking between this however you want. Okay, and then you can walk kind of whenever there's a whole step, you can connect chromatically like that. Now let's go ahead and talk about my favorite part of this. So all of that is pretty straightforward. And the thing that uh, is kind of a barrier for a lot of people is, well, if you want to add chords, we feel limited at first that we can only add chords to the root uh, above the root when we actually land on the root of the chord. So what about on that beat three, on that strong beat there, what if we, what are we gonna add um, above this as a chord if we wanna make it sound like it's fuller still? So there's two ways to think of this. One, you can either add an inversion of the chord and I'll do kind of a mixture of, of these two things and kind of decide what voicings I like, but um, a first inversion of G major seven would be this, three, one, five, uh, major seven, or you can do just a piece of that. This is a really cool voicing. This is just three, one, and five, so it's a G major triad. Here's the coolest thing, and that is that if you know what chord um, you are, if you're thinking of a chord as somewhere in a key, right? So we're going to think of this as the one chord in G major. Whatever the chord is in that key that is a third up, whatever the root um, of like one, two, three, so whatever the three chord is, actually that voicing of just that, that chord, so B minor seven, that is a rootless G major nine chord. So I did a whole video on this about rootless chords. It's a really cool video. So if you wanna kind of see more in-depth theory about what I'm talking about right now, check out that video. I'll put a link to it in the description. But um, this right here is the third of G, and then this is the nine of G. This is the five of G, and that's the major seven of G. So this kind of very standard um, minor seven chord shape is a G major nine chord without the root in there which is fine. We just need something above it to give us that harmonic information that we want. So let's look at it one other way. This is the root of G right here. And then if we know that the nine is the same thing as two, it's a whole step up. Oh, we can actually see, you can do that with any chord. Take any chord, bring the root up a whole step, not a whole step, but a next up in the scale. Um, and you're gonna get a rootless nine voicing that is the same thing as a root position voicing a third up in the key. 
Again, if that's confusing, check out that rootless voicings video. So this voicing I actually like to use a lot more. So for this situation, sounds great. It gives you more color to it too. So if I just do that shell voicing thing, then I get this shape. I like to add this, that's the third, the nine, and the five. And I think that's great. So I kind of have my shapes and voicings that I kind of more typically do, even though this is an option, or this is an option, or this is an option, or this is an option. Um, all four of those. I just typically will use this. That's what I'm kind of more familiar with and, and comfortable with. And of course, you'll find your own preferences in that way. So let's demonstrate with the other chord types. So if we're doing G7, okay, what's the um, either inversion, and you can think of this as uh, kind of mapping out those inversion shapes. Um, and I really like to use shell voicings on this. It just makes it a lot easier. So you can still just use that same G major triad as that there. Or what is the chord that is three, that is a third up, in a key if G7 is the fifth chord in a key okay sixth chord seventh chord okay well the shell voicing of kind of a minor seven shell voicing uh, without without the um, flat five in it because usually it would be half diminished well that works perfectly well that same chord voicing that I was using for G major seven works for G dominant seven I don't get too picky with the voicings. I go with whatever physically is gonna be smoothest, easiest, whatever can make sound good, get the feel that I want to. Um, unless I'm working on actual kind of melodic lines on top or actual concerned with actual voice leading, in this case, we just need something there. So um, I tend to just kind of work out what feels the most comfortable. It can be nice to have a fuller sound sometimes, but if it makes it significantly harder to play, I think it's not worth it because I really wanna go for a smooth, relaxed feel. So now let's talk about if it's G minor seven, okay? Okay, the voicing that I really like to use is this, which is a minor triad inversion. That's the flat three of G, that's the root of G, and that's the five of G. I love that voicing for this. So I like that voicing a lot, but also, what works, if this is the two chord, then a chord that's a third above is major seven. If this is the six chord, then a chord above, a third above is major seven. Um, if it's the three chord, then um, it wouldn't be major seven, but you're pretty safe to just use a major seven um, shell voicing. But that's also why it's nice to use this, um, this uh, triad inversion kind of thing, because then it, you're, you're just safe with any type of minor seven chord. But it works very well to do major seven as well. So let's do that off the fifth string. What if I'm doing D minor seven? I pretty much always do this right now. What is an F major seven chord shape? A third above. And I'm still hearing it as D minor. Dun, 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 dun. Sounds so minor because of the bass line. Dun, dun, flat three, two, one, flat seven, one. Dun, dun, dun. That's really kind of taking the interest, taking the because it's almost kind of like a melodic line down there. So when I play this voicing above, it doesn't sound to me like this root position F major seven chord. It sounds like the flat three of D minor and it works really well. So if we do a D major seven, I always use this off the three of it, a third up, this uh, just minor seven, the standard kind of root position minor seven shape. Um, again, if we look at the actual inversion, this is D major seven. This is the root of D major seven. Bring it up to the nine and you just have that voicing there. Um, I love this. Works so well. And I'm just thinking the whole thing is D major seven. I'm not actually thinking that the chord is different here. I'm definitely not thinking D major seven and then two beats of uh, F sharp minor seven. Nope, I'm just thinking it's all D major seven and that's just a rootless nine voicing of D major seven. And it's just what works when the bass line is on the three of that chord. We'll do a dominant seven here. A third above dominant seven is half diminished. So I'm gonna use this half diminished shape. One, two, three, two, one.
So I personally think that is the game changer thing to figure out that when, when I first figured that out, it was, it was massive. It's what unlocked kind of being able to make sense of this whole approach because I didn't like, it just felt so limiting to only add a chord when I was on a root position, um, when I had the root in the bottom. So I'm walking all around with bass lines, um, just having that other voicing to play off of the three when the three is, is the lowest note, when the walking bass line hits the three, having that other voicing um, just feels so powerful and just fills out the whole thing. So if you want to add extensions, just go ahead, right? So if we take a minor seven shell voicing, D or the root, flat three, flat seven, you know, add the nine to it, great. Everything else still applies. This is what I did in the intro example of the, of the video. And then I'm playing what you could call an F six, nine voicing one, three, six, nine, but it's not that because it's, this is the flat three of D minor, but I'm still thinking of it as, oh yeah, that chord shape is a third up in the key. Love it, that just gives it kind of more that rich sound, that jazz sound, the, the extensions and uh, the color. So what I just did in that previous example, um, accidentally is I jumped to the five, uh, cause I like to do that. And I was trying to contain what I was playing with just what we were talking about, but that kind of came out. So dun, dun, just like we go one, seven, one, two, one, or flat seven, one, two, you know, any of that, you can just go to the five. One, five, one, seven, one, five, one, two, one, five, one, flat seven, one, five, one, five, one, we're just on one chord right this is just a one chord vamp and it's sounding pretty full so that's a lot of stuff but there is one thing we definitely need to address because if you try to do this over a whole tune or in a real context of of music you're gonna no doubt come across a dominant seventh chord with a flat nine you're gonna come across a dominant seventh chord that is the five chord of a minor key now that's really significant because you can just play a normal dominant seventh chord shape um if and, and it works fine because all those same notes are in there but the flat nine indicates that it's coming from a minor scale which means the notes around it that you might want to use for a bass line actually uh wouldn't sound quite right right if you do the one two three it could work but it might not be the sound you're going for or just might sound a little weird but it definitely can work um, a lot of times you can superimpose whatever <laughs> over whatever and go by ear but um technically one flat nine that flat nine is actually in the scale that that chord comes from um, the flat nine and then it still has major three right so what do you do um, over that because also if you go to the three here and you make a half diminished chord it's not the th it's not the chord that is a third up in the scale because we're doing a dominant seventh chord that is this flat nine chord and you don't have to understand all the theory of this but i'm kind of just saying there is an explanation for it this dominant seven flat nine chord comes from harmonic minor so oh that third that chord a third up from d7 flat nine is actually a diminished seven chord shape now if this is a little hard to understand i i get that but now physically playing it it is a breeze once you realize this shortcut because diminished seventh chords, they're so powerful because they are symmetrical. They are just beautifully symmetrical where you can invert to every voicing of that chord with the exact same physical shape, right? So diminished seven chord shape, a minor third down is an inversion of itself, but it's the same physical shape. So now in this world, the reason this is relevant here, I mean, that's kind of cool on its own, but now in this world of walking bass lines, you can walk around with a diminished chord shape and um, get that walking bass line sound. Just treat every chord tone of it as having a note below that you approach. Um, it, and what you're doing is you're outlining the diminished scale if you do that. So, um, so even a D7 flat nine, mm, I would start approaching in that way. I would basically say, oh, what's a half step up from the root right here? That's a, now a diminished seven chord shape. And now I'm gonna walk around. So I'll treat this normal D7, sure enough, that's fine. But then I will, um, you know, use something to get to this shape as a chord tone. So you got this, you got this, you got this. All these chord shapes, D7, diminished shape, diminished shape, diminished shape, and then all the notes that can approach them. So 
it's fine. And now diminished, diminished, walking. Okay, so and and those connecting notes can can technically kind of be whatever. You can go by ear. So the you can even walk with the chords themselves. So that was diminished. That was dominant seven chord flat nine. It's kind of weird to wrap our heads around if we don't know that theory. But then just use that same principle on a diminished chord itself. So if you have a dim, if you have E flat diminished seven, same exact thing. So um, really useful, really fun stuff. Um, if anything is confusing, just throw a question in the comments. I am down there answering questions for sure. And I know that, um, you know, I'll throw some stuff out there that is, I think is interesting and useful and kind of trying to show a little bit of context, but sometimes can be a little outside of the point of just what the main takeaway is. So, you know, if something's confusing, just ask me, I will answer it. This alone, is an exercise I should probably have just done a whole video on because just getting that feel with the diminished seven chord feels so good and you can walk around all over with it. So if this stuff sounds cool to you and you want to be able to do walking bass lines over all these chords, I highly recommend using the shell voicing shapes a good amount of the time. And if you don't know how to interpret literally any jazz chord with a shell voicing, then definitely get my free booklet, free method, PDF, lays it all out for you how you can play any jazz chord with as few as eight shapes by embracing the power of shell voicing. So those shapes and being able to play any jazz chord that way will be super useful if you're wanting to do these walking bass lines around. Half the time I'd say I'm using those, those shapes with this walking bass line stuff and then sometimes I'm filling it in a little more. And if you wanna add extensions like we were doing here, the method for that is usually playing a shell voicing and then adding extensions on top. So that stuff is very foundational, very important. Um, so there's a link in the description to get that if you want to. And thank you so much for all the comments on these videos. I'm doing this for you. That Those really help me know that I'm on the right track with teaching stuff that people want to learn. So I want to start featuring some comments. Um, special thanks to Phil Trey on my uh, video about shell voicings, which is a video that walks through the method of that PDF that I just talked about that you can get for free. Phil Trey said, Jared, I've been teaching for years, and this is one of the best lessons I've seen on shell voicings. I play in a big band, and I had to learn this the hard way lol excellent work my friend cheers so just wanted to feature that comment i really appreciate it that means a lot if you're interested in the shell voicing thing definitely get the pdf but then also check out that video because the video just walks through exactly how to take advantage of it there will be a link to that in the description as well i post a new video every week and next week's video is going to be part three of this series on walking bass lines and chords at the same time and in that one we're just going to do an arrangement of an entire tune we're going to play fly me to the moon the whole thing with walking bass lines and chords added in it's going to sound really freaking cool i have it all written out for you ready to go and so i'm going to post that next week hope to see you there thanks for watching take care and happy practicing